everyone. We've got a good crew, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, I did see we had Liz, and then we lost her, but now maybe she's back. Um, uh, good morning and welcome. I'm Adam Block, uh, Chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. This open meeting of the Needham Council of Economic Advisors is being conducted remotely consistent with state regulations and is being recorded. Public access to this meeting does not ensure there will be public participation unless required by law. At this meeting, we do not anticipate public comment. Um, first, we'll confirm that all members of the CEA are present. In addition to that, all uh, other um, town staff. Um, when I call your name, uh, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, for others participating in the meeting, please also be aware that others may be able to see you. Anything that you share or state will be a matter of public record. All supporting materials for this meeting, including the agenda and minutes, are available on the town's website, Needham ma.gov unless otherwise noted. I should correct myself. The minutes uh, once passed will be uploaded for this meeting will be uploaded uh, to the uh, town site. Uh, the ground rules for this meeting are designed to allow for an accurate public record. I will introduce uh, speakers on our agenda after they conclude their remarks. Uh, members of the council will be asked by name for any comments, questions or motions. Uh, and with that, I shall call the roll. Um, uh, Stu. Present. Uh, I'm obviously present. Uh, Tina, we understand, is not uh, available today. Um, uh, Glenn. Yes. Is it present? Bill Day. I thought I saw you. Present. There he is. Uh, Anne-Marie Dowd. Here. Excellent. Um, Lise. Yes, here. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Virginia. Here. There you are. Mo. Here. You're in a park somewhere. I love it. That's uh, Central Avenue about 120 years ago. Oh, fascinating. Didn't know you were that old, Mo. I am, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> Bob. Here. I see, I see Bob Henschel there. Adam Eisner. I saw you somewhere. Yep, I'm here. There you are. Dave Montgomery. There you here. are. Very good. Rick. Present. Excellent. Uh, Mike Wilcox. Here. And uh, Matt Talkoff. Present and in my attic. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. Excellent. Town staff, we have uh, our economic development manager, Amy. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, from the Department of Public Health, I see Tim. Good morning. Good morning. And our uh, Town Planning Director and Community Development Director, Lee Newman, good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for coming this morning. This being our last meeting for 2020. Uh, what a year it has been. We've been obviously like the rest of the world almost blindsided and really blindsided uh, in February, March, and our whole activity uh, has changed. These meetings have been focused on understanding the effect that uh, pandemic has been having on different sectors within our economy. Um, uh, for next year, uh, that our, myself, uh, Anne-Marie, our vice chair, and Amy will be focusing on uh, reviewing our goals for 2021. Obviously, we're, you know, we're supremely focused on small business. We're going to look to develop some programs that can help provide an uplift as we anticipate the vaccine to roll out, particularly towards the end of the second quarter. What programs can we offer, uh, offer uh, business uh, that can uh, drive more traffic so they can make up a measure of what they lost surely from this past year. 
So we are focused on small business. That's going to be a high priority. And then in addition to that, we're also looking for other um, perhaps cluster-based uh, economic development goals that can help certain parts of industries here. Um, Amy and I would very much like you all to think over the holiday break of other goals and priorities that you think the council should be focused on. And if you could please uh, send uh, a simple email to myself or Amy or both of us, um, that would be very helpful. Uh, in the first of the year, I know that the planning, um, uh, the planning board uh, with the select board and FinCom will be advancing Highway Commercial One, we hope. That's gonna be a, you know, a big project that um, I know we had been directly involved in at its earliest stage. And uh, um, we'll also be having uh, you know, conversations with the select board to see what they want us to be focusing on as well. Um, so I just ask you all to bear in mind what, how different 2020 was and what are reasonable expectations for 20, uh, 2021. Remember that we did, this is the last comment on it, uh, Remember that we did have uh, a very useful project with a Babson group that prepared uh, basically a business inventory of the town. So one of the tactical things we'd like to do from that is, uh, is continue to study it and figure out how we can utilize that. Business has changed so much in 2020 from when we began that uh, exercise and when it was completed. Um, we want to uh, see how we can use that as a tool to help promote growth across all sectors in our economy and maybe change our economic scorecard uh, a little bit to be, um, uh, you know, to reflect the new reality and the new metrics of where business actually stands. So um, I raised those points by way of introduction. Uh, next item on our agenda is uh, the minutes from November 4. There were a couple of uh, minor adjustments. Does anybody else have any comments from the November 4 agenda? Uh, rather, the minutes. David. I just have a question, uh, Adam. Of, um, I'm not clear when you say there have been a, some adjustments, and then I don't know what they are. So I, I, do you mean there's been typos fixed? Is that what you mean? Eff effectively, yes. Like a, a, a period here, a capital okay. H there. Uh, okay. Great. Those okay. those are not not substantive in the content of what was said by anybody. Okay, great, thanks. Form versus fiction. Function. I know, but I was I was going for the play. Okay. Because <laughs> there is no fiction. Um, anybody else have any other uh, comments or questions about the minutes from November four? May I have a motion to then approve the adju uh, minor adjusted minutes? So moved. so moved. And second. a second. We have a motion from Mo and we have a second, I believe, from Bill Day or David. Whatever. <laughs> sure. I wasn't... Flip I wasn't... a coin. What's that? I think it was David. <laughs> okay, so we record David as the second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing and hearing none. Uh, I'll call the uh, I'll call a vote. Please uh, signify the affirmative by saying aye. Stu. Aye. Uh, Glenn. Aye. Bill. Aye. Anne-Marie. Aye. Liz. Aye. Virginia. Aye. Mo. Aye. Bob. Aye. Uh, Adam. That would be Meisner. Did we lose him? No, he's muted. He's muted and we lost his video. Okay. Well, we'll continue nevertheless. Uh, David. Aye. Rick. Aye. Matt. Aye. Aye. Uh, Mike. Aye. And uh, do we have Adam Meisner back? No, he might be on, uh, uh, on something else for a moment. We'll forgive him. <laughs> the chair is aye. The motion carries. Aye. Uh, We'd like to take a moment here and uh, ask Tim, thank you again for joining and thank you 
very much for your outreach to business and to being available to business throughout this year on helping to um, uh, um, you know, provide information on what's happening in town. The contact tracing program, especially as the coronavirus has evolved and, um, and providing solutions for business uh, to help ensure compliance. We're grateful for your participation from the very beginning and steadfast throughout. I'll turn this over to you for another update. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to be with you and I'm, I'm glad I can be of help. Um, so I think uh, a couple things people probably heard, I hope, um, a lot of public health messaging, both uh, state, local and national in the run up to Thanksgiving holiday, encouraging people on how to celebrate Thanksgiving safely. Um, we know that many people did not heed that message, but many people did. Um, so we're hopeful that uh, we're going to avoid a repeat of what we've seen after other holidays like Memorial Day, Fourth of July and Labor Day, which is a fairly significant spike uh, two weeks after. Um, we're already in the middle of a, a fairly significant upswing, so it'll be interesting to see how big a spike we get in the middle of an upswing, but um, that's one of our concerns. In the data that was reported um, last week, uh, it was actually released by the state on Friday, Bless Sorry about you. that. Bless Thank, you. You. Bless Thank you. you. Sorry about that. Still had to show good public health etiquette, even though we're all remote. We appreciate Obviously. the demonstration. Yes. Um, sorry. So in the data that was reported the day after Thanksgiving, it was released at like 5.02 PM on Friday uh, by the Department of Public Health. Needham had its highest number of daily cases um, ever, which was uh, 15 daily cases. Uh, our positive testing rate is uh, increased to about one and a half. Um, the average daily cases is um, per 100,000 population. So Needham um, had been for quite a long time in the, you know, um, two to four to six range uh, of average daily cases. And now it's up at 15, which is not, uh, not great. Uh, it's certainly a lot better than a number of surrounding communities, um, but it's still not a great sign. Um, we are as a town uh, with um, support from the town manager's office and from the public information officer, going to be working on a, um, a couple of different campaigns, uh, some of which have a um, sort of a combination of business, uh, civic engagement and business engagement with public health messaging. Um, we're hoping that we're gonna be able to roll out one of them in uh, mid-December and then potentially one of them uh, later uh, in the winter. But you know, some of the general ideas would be, you know, keep your distance now so that we can have a cookout later, you know, postpone that party with friends so you can go out to dinner, you know, the idea being basically that people have to sort of sacrifice right now so that they can make it uh, possible that we return to normal uh, is the general idea behind it. Um, so we're, we're excited about those. We're still sort of going through concepts, but the idea is essentially um, public advertising in the form of uh, street signs, billboards, wraps around like uh, trash cans, that sort of thing. Um, as well as some small, um, you know, paid advertising in the Needham Times and other places. But um, our hope is that we can use that to sort of try to reinforce good behavior and, and sort of positive public health messaging. Um, the volume of cases is significant um, across the state. And so there's a, depending on where you go, there can be a significant delay in the test results coming back, which makes, I think, everyone's life harder. Um, for people who don't know, if you do get tested, um, you are required to quarantine until you get your results back, um, which works out great if you get your results back within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, it doesn't work out so good as in the case yesterday um, where someone got their results back nine days after they were tested. Uh, because okay. even the best person is going to break quarantine at some point if you don't get the results back. Can, you hate can, it. can I interrupt and just ask sure. a question about the expectation of quarantine? I know this has come up with some of the members in my own social circle. Sure. I, for instance, uh, my, my peers have, um, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, um, uh, my, my group has um, a, you know, a number of kids, uh, elementary kids, uh, school kids. And um, the question that came up about quarantining is if we get tested, does that mean like a nanny can't come to the house? Obviously the kids stay home. And uh, we as parents, uh, if the kid has been exposed, 
um, and the kids getting tested, do we as parents have to also quarantine and not leave the house, not go to the grocery store, not do a takeout at a restaurant? Can you explain a little bit more about what the expectation is for quarantining in that circumstance? Sure, absolutely. Um, so there's generally sort of two ways to test, right? There's testing when you have symptoms. So you've got a fever, you've got uh, severe shortness of breath, something like that. You talk to your doctor and the doctor says, I really think you need to get tested for COVID. And there's testing when you're asymptomatic, which means you're showing no symptoms whatsoever, but for some circumstance, like you have to go have minor foot surgery and the hospital is saying, well, you need to get a COVID test before we're gonna let you in, or you're traveling, you know, there's a number of reasons potentially. Um, when you are sick, um, when you are actually sick with COVID, what you do is you're told to isolate. So we're separating someone who is uh, ill from people who are healthy. When you have been exposed to someone who is ill, who has COVID, you are told to quarantine. We don't know for a fact that you're sick, but we need to, because you've been exposed, keep you away from the general population. So there's there's a different um, wording and there's also you know, different state regulations that go along with each. Um, one of the key distinctions uh, is that there is a different sort of course of time for how long you have to stay isolated versus how long you have to quarantine. Um, and the wrinkle that I'll throw in is that up until about two weeks ago, the answer for quarantine was 14 days, no matter what. Um, your date of exposure being day zero, 14 days after that, you have to be in quarantine. Um, and quarantine for this purpose would mean um, you could take a walk with a mask on, you could sit down on your back porch, but you couldn't um, go to a store, you shouldn't have anyone over, that sort of thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that your kids couldn't go to school because you, um, if we use Adam as the example, you, Adam, have been exposed to someone at COVID at work, say, and so you're a close contact and we're worried you might have COVID. And we say, we need you to get tested and you're required to quarantine. Your family members who are in close proximity to you and would of course meet the definition of close contact are second degree contacts. So we don't know that you have COVID. So they don't, their movements are not restricted in this instance. If when you get tested, you do come back with COVID then they become close contacts and they also have to quarantine. Um, I think, you know, we would, there's a number, I mean, if you look at the number of people who are testing versus the number of people who are positive, the positive testing rate is still low. In Needham, it's 1.5%. So we're not suggesting that your kids should stay home because the numbers say you probably don't have COVID. We need you to stay home because we need an abundance of caution. And if you go out and interact with a whole bunch of people and then it turns out you have COVID, the contact tracing and the exposure is huge and that's how diseases spread rapidly, right? Because you go out and infect five other people and then they infect sure. three other people and you've got you know, geometric growth. Um, so for, for quarantine, we would expect people to, to stay in their homes. But if, for example, your son or daughter had to quarantine, you as the parent, you know, you should do your best to, you know, make sure that they have their, you know, mask on in the house, you know, just in case, but you could go get groceries, you could go out and go to work. It would only be if they came back as a positive case with confirmed COVID that then you'd be a close contact and would have to stay in the home. That's so very that, helpful. Mo, okay. you have, I see you have a hand raised. I, yes. If I could say one thing before Mo does, just uh, if Please. the one challenge I think is that up until two weeks ago, it was 14 days, regardless of whether you get a negative test, you've got to quarantine for 14 days. The state introduced new guidance about two weeks ago that says, if you don't have symptoms and if you've had a negative test, then you can get tested on day eight or later. And once the results of that are back, presuming they're negative, then you can end quarantine. So, you know, if testing was coming back in a day or two, you could end quarantine on day nine or 10. If testing is coming back in nine days, well, you're still gonna end on day 14. That's the new Massachusetts rule. The CDC just came out and basically said they're thinking about doing what Massachusetts is doing, except doing it on day seven. So then there's a question of if Massachusetts is going to adjust theirs. So unfortunately, the answer on quarantine has become a lot more complicated. I gave mm -hmm. you the sort of simple one. And then here's the new caveats tossed in. Um, I'm sorry to cut Mo. Mo? No, no, that's all right. You, first of all, you don't have to apologize, Tim. Um, question regarding masking and restaurants 
And the background to this is there are some people in the community who are very upset about the occasional people they see without masks. I get a lot of calls on that. I think my colleagues do too. And the other question comes up with respect to uh, what's happening with the restaurants, particularly those that still have some eat-in capability. Are you getting complaints about the restaurants not masking or not enforcing masking? So, um, you know, I, I think over the course of the pandemic, things have changed and improved. You know, in, in May, for example, we were getting some concerns from a number of customers about a number of restaurants with someone, you know, not remembering to have their mask or having it fall down. We've worked with uh, the businesses in Needham who are very responsible people. Um, and I will tell you that virtually 100% have improved, have better signage, have better training for their staff, have expectations for their customers and have worked with their staff to have a you know, gentle but firm way to um, speak to a customer if the customer isn't following the rules, um, but then ultimately enforce the, if you're not gonna have a mask, you have to leave with the caveat that if there's a medical disability that you make known that you have a medical disability, we have to permit access. Um, most places have been very good. There's one place I think that we've had uh, repeated complaints about and we're working to address that. I think one of the challenges we have is um, if you tell me some places violating the rules, I will go talk to them. I have to see them violating the rules or have sort of video evidence of them violating the rules in order to write them a ticket or shut them down. Okay. So when people, yeah, and I see it on Facebook, I see complaints from, from residents, my staff or I will go in there and I don't know if it's the luck of the draw, but the establishment I'm thinking about always has the, the two people with medical exemptions don't have masks on and everyone else does. And then I see on Facebook that someone went in and everyone didn't have their mask on. I don't know if that's an exaggeration. I do believe given the way the proprietor handles himself and some of the things he's posted on a different social media site that he doesn't believe that masks are appropriate, but we have to see the violation in order to, to actually write a, a fine or give a warning or, or ultimately shut somebody down. And has any, has anybody, nobody's been fined yet, right? No, um, a couple of established or two establishments have been given warnings. One has been given sort of corrective training and one was called in for an administrative hearing, uh, which is essentially a much more serious version, which is straighten up and fly right, or we're going to close you. Um, however, they have since that time not had any documented by health department staff, any documented violations. There's still a lot of people complaining in the community. So I, I do ascribe some level of the, if there's smoke there, there's some fire, but we have to see it. Um, right. Mo, you, you asked Did another part of- Just follow that up with one mm -hmm. more. Sure. Is, is there anything the town should be doing to address what may be misinformation or exaggeration on Facebook? I think that's an interesting point. I think, you know, historically the town tries to monitor Facebook and be aware of things, but doesn't like to get into sort of a back and forth response. Right. Um, but, you know, that might be something that we should talk to, to Cindy, the PIO, and, and to Kate or Katie about, because maybe there is a way to sort of tell people there's a helpful way to report a, a complaint, and then there's maybe a less helpful way, and the less helpful way is going onto Facebook and writing about it. Um, I mean, part of my question or concern is that we've gotten a number of complaints from people, um, and we know how to tell, for example, when it's one ex-employee that's got an ax to grind. We've dealt with that in the past with, with other establishments where some ex-employee is trying to you know, drop a dime on their former employer because they're aggrieved for some reason. Right. We know what that looks like and we, we work within the context of that, but that's not something that would get someone shut down. Um, the number of people that are complaining are indicative of the, the fact that there is a problem. But part of my sort of what I want to say publicly, and I haven't figured out a nice way to say this was, you've complained, but you keep going back and going to the establishment. If, if it makes you uncomfortable, <laughs> and I agree, we want to make it, you know, we want everyone to follow the rules, but if it makes you uncomfortable, don't go back. There's plenty of other of that type of establishment in Needham. Um, but Mo, I think I want to jump back if I could to one part of your question. Sure. Needham, um, right now we're seeing transmission uh, largely in family or social gathering transmission. Um, we haven't seen uh, outbreaks or large clusters attributed to restaurants. So we haven't seen, um, you know, the, um, the 
you know, a, a, the cook getting sick and getting the bus boy sick and then getting three different parties of, you know, of diners sick. Um, I will tell you that, that there's a lot more risk for indoor activities than outdoor. I think that's obvious to people. There are pretty significant safeguards that are set up to make indoor dining safe. I think if, if people have gone um, inside, in, in, at least in most Needham establishments, um, there's good spacing, there's um, other protocols, all the staff are masks. In some cases, um, there's other sort of safety measures in place. These aren't crowded establishments. You're not bumping into people. Um, so I think, you know, people who might be saying, well, we should stop indoor dining. It's a possibility, but I, I want to follow data. And right now our data is saying that indoor dining isn't driving transmission in Needham. What's driving transmission in Needham is people having play dates. It's people having their, you know, their cousin and his family over for, for dinner. It's, it's activities like that. It's, it's in-home transmission and small social gathering transmission. Um, for example, we had a case, and I think Mo knows this, of someone who, um, a high school age person who traveled uh, out of state to a higher risk state to look at a college. That person came back and didn't quarantine and their parents didn't quarantine or make the child quarantine. Um, that child went out to dinner with friends and then went to an indoor party with friends. We found no transmission at the restaurant to anyone else. We found a bunch of transmission from the party. So it's entirely possible that the transmission occurred in the restaurant or the party immediately afterwards. I think that's you know open to question, but there were people who weren't at the dining room table, the restaurant table with this person who were at the party that got sick. And there was no one else beyond the person's immediate party at the restaurant that got sick. To me that, you know, this is one example and, and the plural of anecdotes is not data, right? right? But but that's one example that shows that I think we have a decent setup that the rules that the state has established in which Needham is enforcing have made restaurants um, as safe as possible for indoor dining in Needham. Um, I think everyone has to figure out their own tolerance for risk and what they think is safe and what they don't. But I just have to tell people that our data shows we don't have we have not found no evidence of transmission. I have to be more specific. So, you know, evidence of absence is not, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, right? But we have no confirmed evidence of transmission in restaurants in Needham. Thanks, Tim. That's very, very helpful to know that. And that was useful to me too, particularly. So thank you. Adam Meisner, did you have a question for Tim as well? I did, but I think he addressed it. It was, I was going to bring up how on Facebook last week, there was like an outrage about one place that had numerous like chefs and cooks and staff and everybody that wasn't wearing masks. And it sounds like he probably, you know, it, it sounds like it's the same restaurant. I don't know which one it was. I could assume which one it was, but. Uh, it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Please. I have I more Facebook and it saves me a lot of grief, but. Right. I have just one question about how you do positivity rates for Needham, yeah. given that I have a young adult in Boston who's still registered at home. He got COVID with a number of other Needham people who thought they were being smart and just had a, like gathered in an apartment, a few of them. Mm -hmm. So does that, and he got tested at a Lexington urgent care. And so where does that test result follow him? So this is, um, one of the things I, I always want to caution people is when we produce data, it's accurate as of the exact moment we're telling you and not a second longer. Um, so if, if insurance was used for the test, then the default is the address to which the is, um, insurance is associated. So in the case of, for example, college students, we could have a test result from University of Texas at Austin laboratory that says, um, Johnny Johnson is in Needham. Well, chances are Johnny Johnson is in Austin, Texas. But what that means is Johnny has health insurance through his parents and his parents live in Needham and the address associated with that insurance is Needham. So initially it reports and hits as a Needham case. After two or three days, we, we, we say we want to reclassify this. We don't think it's a Needham case. We think it belongs in Austin and we, they need to know this and they need to be made aware of it. The state reviews and then reclassifies it. But so, you know, you could ask me on a Monday how many cases we have, and I could say 10, which I wish we had 10, we have more than 10. And then if you ask me on Wednesday, that number could have gone down by two and up by three. 
you know, at the, it could be 11 now and you think it's changed by one, but it actually changed down two and then went up three. Um, so yeah, it's the, it's the address. Um, it eventually becomes the address of residence, okay. but it takes some time to get there sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim, I was the first culprit who interrupted you. So if there is a okay. comment that you have. No, I think I, I hit it, hit the um, major points I wanted to. I think, um, you know, I, um, Amy, I wonder if um, maybe uh, in January we could potentially include Adam and Amy, if we could include Cindy um, to maybe talk about um, the um, campaign that we're hoping to, to do the public messaging campaign to maybe get some feedback uh, before we finalize it. Or, you know, if there's one or two members that are particularly interested, maybe we could work with them offline before the next meeting and, and um, talk to them about it. Cause we do want to make sure that this is something that the business community and the community as a whole understands is, is sort of a, a collective call to action. We need, we need residents to be more responsible. I think our business owners are already being very responsible, but we need them to continue to be incredibly responsible. Um, and that's how we, we keep the numbers low and we eventually get back to hopefully something like normal. You mentioned vaccine. Um, uh, ASIP yesterday came out with recommendations which are generally followed. I think there's always some question with uh, the current federal administration on whether they will follow recommendations from, from scientists, but um, with a priority for the initial vaccine push for healthcare workers, uh, and there's some question on how that will be defined. So <laughs> it looks like it will be broader than just hospital workers, but for example, does that include all the support staff at a hospital? Does it include you know, the ambulatory care office where your primary care doctor is and the support staff there, but it will include uh, residents of long-term care and assisted living facilities, and it will include healthcare workers. Um, that will take up all, and maybe, maybe a little bit more of the first push of vaccine, the, the, the 20 to 40 million doses that'll be available. Um, so you mentioned, Adam, a timeline, which I think we're thinking is correct, although I think we, we think the federal government has recently said they thought people would be 70% of the population might be vaccinated by May. I think that's wildly optimistic. I think if we have vaccine to start giving people, which would be a two or three month process to get everyone in need them vaccinated. Um, if we have that in May, I'll be very happy that we can start that process, but it won't be an instantaneous thing. Uh, agreed. Understood. And, uh, um, I, I would not expect that uh, the population will be completely immunized, you know, by the end of the second quarter. I do think that the stage two uh, dissemination of the vaccine mm -hmm. would be great, would be more widespread yep. by the end of June. Um, yeah. But uh, Bob, did you have your question, your hand up? I did, but uh, go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. What when um, so in terms, so uh, Anne Marie, uh, if you're available, and Amy, I'm, I'm sure I'm happy to help. Um, uh, I certainly would love to uh, talk to Tina about this because she's hands-on retail and directly impacted, and she's expressed some challenges with compliance and so on and messaging. Um, Liz, I. Uh, was that something you'd be able to participate in and help? I would, yes, I'd love to help with the public messaging. Great, and Bob, um, uh, as a landlord with uh, a, you know retail in the area, um, do you have any comment, or uh, are you able to participate? Or um, sure, be happy to. Great, and did you have any other comments or questions? Yeah, I just had a couple of questions for Tim. Um, mainly out of curiosity, um, I know this isn't your purview, but um, is there a reason um, why these FDA approval meetings um, are taking so long to, to occur? You know, um, the first one isn't until next week and the Moderna one is the week after. Uh, meanwhile, the efficacy of these have been known for some time. Um, uh, so I, I would tell you that that it's going a lot faster than it used to, which is, which is appropriate, obviously, because we're in a pandemic and it's a pandemic that's, you know, uh, affecting, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people's lives and, and costing, you know, hundreds of thousands of people their lives. Um, it's going much quicker. I will say there's a phenomenal amount of data. And for example, there is a, a lot we don't know about the vaccines. There are sort of two key considerations when you're thinking about a vaccine or maybe three. Um, 
One is how effective is it at keeping you from getting sick? And that's the data we've seen so far. That's the 95%, which is fantastic. There's a sort of embedded question about, is that immunity uh, temporary? How long does it last? Um, you know, is it something that lasts, like, do you need a booster shot every five years? Is it something you need to get every year? Would it last you for the rest of your life? And that's sort of still to be determined. The second big thing though is, if it keeps you from being sick, does it prevent you from spreading the infection? So you could still be exposed to COVID. You could be fine essentially because your immune system is primed and will respond immediately. And you know, you'd start to get a fever and your immune system would beat it back and you wouldn't even notice it. But it could be that you're still transmitting it effectively to other people. So that's sort of the second piece of data that we don't have. And, and the FDA is not waiting to get that data, but that's something that's really important because it changes sort of the calculus long-term of how do we manage COVID? How does it fit within the population? What is the level needed for true herd immunity? Um, and we don't have a sense of that number yet. I mean, if it, if it did both at 95%, that would be phenomenal. Um, that'd be so good. Okay, yeah, I, I, um, yeah, my, I guess uh, my question was, is there something happening behind the scenes that we're not aware of leading up to that date? Because um, I just haven't heard anything as to why specifically December 10th and December 17th. Um, but it sounds to me like what you're saying is that there is some verification that's going on that we're just not aware of. Yeah, I think, you know, there's essentially, you know, the, because it was released sort of in a press release, they gave you sort of the top sheet, you know, and like, you know, polling data, right? You right. get like a top sheet and there's like 280 pages of very granular data behind it. And the FDA is going right, through that right. granular data, although it's, in this case, it's, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pages of data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that makes sense. I, I just hadn't heard an explanation as to why. And um, so uh, why it's why it would take until. I think it's week. still That's taking longer than that. anyone would like, but it is much quicker than it would it usually would be. Yeah. I mean, without an explaction, it just sounds like that's like the most, like that's the date that worked on everybody's calendar, you know, like I'm free on the 10th so I can do it that, you know, it's like, you know, it, it didn't seem to make any sense to me, but I, I hadn't heard a reason why. Um, I work in government. And you, and I really you, hurt. I hope that's not the case. I really hope there was a doodle <laughs> that was sent out and that was the only day that worked for everybody. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm on vacation this week. I can't make it. Um, and I think you touched upon my, my second question, which was, um, and that's an interesting point. I never heard that or never thought about it, that even though you could be immune, that you could still spread um, the virus. Um, is the expectation, I'm certainly the hope, but is the expectation that even though we're not going to be at full immunity for another six months, best case, do you expect to see these numbers start to get blunted um, as the vaccine rolls out? Uh, so in other words, instead of 150,000 positive cases a day, uh, you want to see that number almost immediately start to trend downward? Or is it, is it going to just take time before that happens? I think it's going to take time. I think it's also going to be dependent on the messaging, how willing people are to get vaccinated and whether they, you know, even though they haven't been vaccinated yet, whether their behavior changes and they start engaging in sort of riskier behavior, do they start, you know, hanging out with people en masse? Do they start having large gatherings? Um, I think, you know, the, the, good thing for us is we think based on disease transmission and the fact that basically the physics of virus transmission says that the virus does a lot better in dry air and cold air or relatively cold air than it does in hot and humid air. There, you know, there's a reason our flu season is the winter, not the summer, right? The flu season in the Southern hemisphere is our summer, their winter. And that's partially just about people being indoors. So it's easier to transmit and partially about the fact that the virus goes further, you know, in a, you know, office setting than it does, you know, at, at a hot day at the beach. Um, so our hope is that as we get into the spring and as we start vaccinating people, the fact that people no longer have to be indoors in a large part of the country, that they can be outdoors, will also help to hopefully dramatically drop the daily cases. Thank you very much. Uh, David, I see your hand is up, but uh, Rick's hand was up before. So I'm going to go to Rick and then to David. Thank you. Uh, Tim, um, <clears throat> Do you, uh, do you expect that there may be some sort of a mandate and what would that be for vaccination? I know that's a, that's a kind of a hot potato political question, but I gotta believe for schools and things like that, there's gotta be some, sort, some form of mandated vaccination. I think, and it's an assumption, and I think as I've told everyone, people, I presented to the exchange club back in February, and I think Mo was there, and 
some, you know, they asked me a question about this, you know, virus that was going on in China. And I had a lot of assumptions like, I'm pretty concerned about it, but it's not going to get here for a long time. And I don't think we really need to worry about it. Needless to say, I was basically wrong about everything. Um, so I'll throw that out as my big caveat. I do think that they would, uh, the state would likely require, um, obviously with medical or religious exemptions still being an option, um, vaccination for COVID uh, in the schools. This, the state um, required flu shots, for example, that uh, students have until December 31st to get vaccinated or they can be excluded from school. Um, so I, I do expect that the state would follow suit with that for COVID. I imagine that most hospitals would, would work to require that, or most healthcare providers would work to require that of their employees. I, don't, um, I do not foresee a broad mandate of like the Governor Baker saying, you know, everyone needs to come forth and be counted and get shot in the arm. I don't think it would be a broad push like that, but I do think in, in certain sectors and in certain categories, yes. Uh, just as an aside, considering the fact that we're a Council of Economic Advisors, I heard a, an astounding statistic this morning on the radio that 44% of small businesses in Massachusetts have closed their doors. Uh, Lisa, I don't know if you could comment on that or if you could support that. I don't, know, I don't know how they define small business, but that to me is an astounding number. It's astounding. And those are the ones that gave up before the winter. I can't even imagine what it's going to be like in the next couple months. So we just held a webinar about um, the options of utilizing bankruptcy to, or going dormant to get you through this period. Um, I'm not surprised. I don't, I don't know what they qualified as a small business in that 44%. But, um, and I think if you break out restaurants, that would definitely be different than the remaining category. But, uh, you know, it is, it is going to be brutal, especially if no stimulus comes through before the end of the, before the vaccine arrives. Um, Just all reality. The, yeah. uh, all the more, reason why we have this shop local campaign, uh, you know, the 100 day challenge. So any opportunity you have to support local business, mm -hmm. you know, certainly greatly appreciated. Uh, David, did you have a question for Tim? Yeah, um, it may be just a question of, of how to contribute our thoughts further on the um, health campaigns you're working on. Sure. But um, it just occurs to me that it seems, it seems like in addition to raw um, health data that you obviously crunch and share. Um, there's an element of how we how we get messages out in town. This this is a there's a, all kinds of political implications to to this issue, and and I'm wondering if this might be a worthwhile to consider using some of the uh, so-called emotionally intelligent signage that we did some sometime in the last ten years or so. We, the the street signs that. Um, you know, where's the fire, slow down, that type of alternate thing, um, which was designed to sort of get people outside of just stop, speed limit 35, you know, but, but to think about it a little bit. And mm -hmm. that was a, a, an actual campaign that I believe it was um, an initiative out of the town, man, uh, town manager's office. And maybe there's a connection there um, to, con to consider doing. Sure, I, I think we're certainly open to that. And I think, you know, you speak to, um, you know, trying to get people to sort of uh, broaden their perspective or think beyond the immediate, um, the immediacy of their actions and think to sort of the ripple effects. And I think that's exactly what COVID is, right? It, it's it's saying, can you delay some of your satisfaction? It's, you know, it's for people like the marshmallow test, right? Um, can you delay some of your satisfaction to get better satisfaction later? And, and I think that's a question, or can you delay some of your satisfaction so the whole, the community as a whole can be better? Um, and I'm open to any ideas on how to do that because uh, it's a challenging message to relay to people and, and everybody's very, very tired of COVID. What yeah, I guess I, I'm just trying to say, I don't think it should be limited to the health department to deliver okay. the tough news. It, yes, it should include the health department, but it's a it, maybe it needs to be a... Um, got the imprimatur of the town as a whole, you know. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I think we may lose Lee's uh, in a moment or two. And before we do, um, I, uh, I'd like to just, uh, you know, give you an opportunity to let us know what uh, you're seeing as uh, and hearing from the experiences of, you know, smaller local business in town. 
Um, well, it's kind of random how some businesses are doing really well and others are hanging on. So I do feel that the feedback we're getting is they truly are, it sounds trite, but they really are all in this together and everybody's rooting for everybody else. Um, so I do feel the feedback we're getting, the merchants are feeling a lot of love. Um, there's just so much that people need right now. You know, there's, there's not all that many things you need to purchase right now. So that's, a, that's struggling for some consumers. Um, I think the gift cards are going well. Um, our 30 day, our 100 day challenge has 30 days left. We're going to regroup and figure out what to do from January forward. The restaurants are coming up with masks and blankets to give out. Stacy's, I have to tell you, Stacy's gave, turned over proceeds from their cookbook to help her, the restaurant group that the chain, that she's been involved with the chamber. Um, like everybody is just helping each other. So if, if we lose a couple, it's not because people haven't tried. So, um, you know, this unseasonably warm weather is really helping the restaurants because there is a group of people that just won't go inside regardless, but a lot of people are willing to sit outside in the cold with blankets. So hopefully um, we'll get that um, some more weekends like that. And other than that, we are just constantly rethinking ways of trying to help. Can I just jump in on there. that? Sure, Mel. Mm -hmm. The Exchange Club is giving each of its members, and there are about 90 of us, a $50 gift certificate to one of the local businesses. Oh, nice. And that's, that's coming this week. So, and members were able to choose which particular business they want to, and there was a list. So that's Perfect. as a result of your campaign. So. Oh, wonderful. Somebody should send me information on that. We'd be happy to share. What, what, we're going to do a PR of... release, but we'll mention okay. the uh, chamber when we do it. Great. Thank you. I, I just, you know, even today, the floor, you know, New England floor is posted thanks to the chamber and to the community. I mean, everybody gets it. It's the community coming together to do this. Yeah. The we in that case, by the way, is the exchange club, not, not the town. I have a different hat. <laughs> got it. Got it. But I actually have to jump off. We're doing our view, the last virtual open house for the chamber right now. And we have a lot of people that are interested in joining and helping support the chamber. And we have a lot of new members that are zooming in right now to learn the full benefits of being a member. So um, I have really enjoyed being a part of this committee and I look forward to being here every month in 2021. So thanks for having mm -hmm. me. And I would love to participate in the public messaging campaign those college young 20 somethings are going to be brutal. So I'm happy to work on that subcommittee of subcommittee because they all think they're doing the right thing. They think they know what they're doing and it's not the right thing. So um, have a nice, I know, have a nice holiday season and um, I'm sure I'll see some of you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. Very good. Um, uh, Tim, were there any other last comments you wanted to, or pieces of wisdom you wanted to impart on us before? No, I, I think, um, I guess the, the one thing I mentioned briefly, and some people have asked about it, the health department uh, and the town as a whole are planning, actively planning, and have been for quite a long time for vaccinations for COVID. We've got sort of contingency plans. We've got different setups. We treated our flu clinics this fall as sort of a dry run for COVID in terms of better spacing, higher volume, different traffic flow patterns. Um, so if people are interested in that, it's not that we're sort of sitting on our hands. We're going to be ready to go as soon as um, we get the word and as soon as we get supply. We actually already ordered, for example, an ultra cold freezer that's supposed to arrive next week just in case that's the vaccine we get. Uh, different vaccines, as people may or may not know, have different uh, handling requirements. Um, so I just, if people are wondering, we the town is going to be ready and the town has been actively working on that for quite a while. Excellent, I can't thank you enough. Um, you know, both as a resident and uh, as, um, you know, uh, participating on this council, your contributions have been very helpful and extremely informative to all of us that we get to then, you know, communicate your message to our other, you know, people within our own group. So, is, you know, we appreciate your steadfast support and communication. I'm happy to be here and I'm uh, happy to work with you guys. Uh, Adam and Amy, I'll follow up um, in the next day or so about the um, campaign. Terrific. Thank you. 
Um, I'd like to now uh, chat and uh, understand what else is happening uh, on the front with, in particular, uh, the office sector. Um, uh, anyone like to jump in before I start pointing fingers? I'll start pointing fingers. Mike, uh, um, what are you, what are you uh, seeing that may be different from or similar to uh, your experiences from uh, November? I think we're continuing on in the same manner that we have been. Our occupancy at our buildings in the suburbs are probably running around 20%. I think it, uh, it improved a little after Labor Day, but um, it's pretty consistent at that level. O occupancy um, or vacancy? Occupancy, physical occupancy of the buildings. Got it, got it, got it. And I think that probably runs a, a few points higher than what you might see um, in, in the downtown area, from what I understand. We don't have a lot of product there, but yeah, and I, I don't want to sort of bore you with what we've talked about before, but it's um, some tenants are renewing, some tenants are downsizing, some tenants want to do short-term leases, some tenants are, are not renewing and consolidating. So it's uh, kind of more of the same. And um, I assume from what we've been hearing this morning on the on the public health side, it'll probably stay that way into the uh, first couple quarters of, uh, of next year. Thank you. Uh, Adam, uh, what's your experience on the street? Um, well, actually, I just got an email about 30 seconds ago. Um, you know, the retail world is, is, is hurting. It's, you know, it's no secret. And it looks like two of the larger retail um, brokerage firms in the area are actually joining forces in the Dartmouth Company and, and Atlantic Retail, um, which I think is interesting, but doesn't really seem to be a surprise just given, you know, what's happening. And I think what's really not only because of COVID, but I think what's been happening over the last few years. So um, very interesting to see that, you know, merger taking place here. Um, in terms of, you know, the office world that, that, that we're in, um, it was quiet for a few weeks, but now over the last, I'd say 10 to 14 days, it's, it's picked up in terms of tour volume activity, um, moving through some letter of intents uh, and negotiating leases as well, mostly renewals, but actually we're working on a couple expansions, uh, new locations for groups um, or additional locations, I should say, um, and just expansions within you know, an actual building, um, which, is, which is good to see. Um, we have been hearing from a few more landlords about you know, some of their tenants that are falling behind on rent. Um, so they want to be proactive and putting it on the market um, because it doesn't seem any, these particular groups seem like the types that probably won't make good on, on their back rent. Um, if they, who knows if, if they survive or not, but um, so yeah, activity has, has picked up a little bit and I think it'll continue through the end of the year as people you know, need to make decisions as their lease expire and they can only push them off for so long. So. Thank you. That's uh, it's uh, fairly encouraging. Uh, uh, Bob, what are you experiencing uh, here in Needham? Yeah, you know, on the office side, it's pretty much um, consistent with uh, what we talked about uh, last month. Um, the, excuse me, on the retail side, we uh, have just experienced our first casualty, um, COVID-related casualty. Uh, so um, that I suspect may be uh, the first of more to come. Uh, you know, and, and anecdotally, you know, I, 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 uh, I'm always talking to my friends uh, who's, who work downtown and, uh, uh, you know, one friend in particular is, is really getting sick and tired of working out of his basement, uh, you know, so I, I think, uh, the, the, the effect of that is, is settling in, which is, I find to be encouraging. And um, uh, I have an, another friend whose son works uh, downtown uh, for a, an investment bank. And uh, he says he's really struggling with the fact that um, he just feels like he's not being mentored. Um, you know, he's sitting at home in his apartment in front of a computer screen. Half the time, he doesn't know if he's doing things right, doing them wrong. Uh, you know, you can only check in with your superior so many times uh, online. Uh, 
and I, I think that's going to be a real driver here. Uh, you, you know, if, if I had to read the read the tea leaves, um, I think it's going to be the the Gen Xers who get us back in the office space, certainly more than than our generation, because uh, I think they need the the oversight, they need the mentoring, they uh, they need the socialization. Um, so um, I'm looking I'm looking to the kids to save us all here. But uh, yeah, like in terms of the office market in Needham, it's 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 sporadic, you know. So you know, one day we'll have a lot of activity, uh, the next day it'll be be quiet, uh, just kind of sputtering along. And like Mike said, I, I've kind of seen the the spectrum on on lease renewals. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of run the gamut, short term. Uh, you know, uh, we've had a few tenants, uh, you know, renew kind of under standard terms. And actually, I've had a couple of tenants expand, so you know it's kind of a mixed bag. Are you finding uh, that physical occupancy is around that twenty percent mark in the office? Uh, in your office, I, I don't have a good handle on it. Uh, I, you know, anecdotally, I'd say it's in our case it's probably closer to fifty, and that's just based on counting cars in the parking lot. Uh, uh, you know, walking through the halls uh, of our buildings. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd put it north of 20, but probably no, no higher than 50, if I guess. Okay. Uh, I uh, would just say, uh, it's interesting to your point, Bob, the tenants that I see that are not coming back are the ones that have the youngest employees, the tech related companies. And, and of course, nationally you read or hear that a lot of them have already, you know, put markers out there for next June, next September, maybe, you know, you can work for home for forever kind of thing. And a lot of the leases, the number of leases that we've done have been more traditional law firms, financial services, insurance companies. And those are the people that I see that are coming back to the office more than on, on the tech side. So I, I'd like to believe that they'll lead the way. It's just the, the people they work for, uh, I think are, are much more uh, prone to um, to defer to uh, longer term uh, visions of when people go back to the office. Yeah, I just hope that the decision makers realize the benefit of, of being together in a group uh, in terms of what that means to productivity and, and, uh, and mentoring. Yeah, I don't know, I, I, to be determined, I guess. Good. I, th I think we've all spent the last nine months trying to handicap the world, see where it's going and you know, it's, Mi mixed it, results. <laughs> What's that? With mixed results. Yeah, right, right, exactly, exactly. That's why I'm not a professional gambler, I guess. Yeah, and that whole sort of hub and spoke thing that everyone talked about early, you know, I don't think we're seeing much of the urban um, exodus either into the suburbs. Of, I agree, that, that was a great theory, but uh, ha haven't seen it materialize yet. And maybe it's too soon, uh, but honest to God, you know, by, by the time, because of the lag effect of, of lease expirations, but by, by the time that people are able to react to that, um, you know, I, I sincerely hope that, you know, by the start of third quarter, we're well on our way back to normal. So um, we'll, we'll see. And, and at that point, it's going to be less about COVID and it's going to be more about lifestyle. Like, can you work effectively from home? Not that you have to work from home, but is it a better alternative? And um, I guess that remains to be seen. I'm going to, uh, Rick, I see your hand up. I'm going to come to you in a minute. And then uh, um, uh, I'm going to ask a, a, an open question about Highway Commercial One and demand, generally speaking, for office space. Um, uh, but uh, Rick, I'd like to come to you. You had your, your hand up. Um, I just wanted to re relate a, uh, an experience I had that uh, Recently, I had to file some paperwork for a, a, a letter of good, good standing down at one Ashburton place, downtown Boston, which is impossible to, to find a parking spot. And I was able to find a meter within, you know, 200 steps of the front door of that building, which I've never been able to do before. Uh, and that's with all the considering all the parking spaces that are secured for the courthouse and, 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 and uh, state activities that you, you, you can't use that are around the building. So that's how much of a ghost town it was in Boston. And I, I've, again, I was astonished by that experience. Happy for it, but astonished. 
Um, did you have a, do you have something else? Yeah, um, with the uh, with the retail, um, um, I learned of a uh, adaptive reuse situation. You know, a lot of the malls are in big trouble. Their anchors are gone, and uh, the smaller uh, businesses are going out of business. And in one particular, and I can't remember the name of the mall, but I think it was in uh, the south part of the state, went up for auction. Uh, it happened to be in a location that had its own off-ramp off a major highway. And the, the guy who bought it at, op, at auction is developing it for the, quote, Amazons of this world. So they're converting, they're tearing down the mall and, and converting it into huge warehouse distribution off the highway to attract the Wayfarers and the Amazons and, and, and that ilk of the e-commerce economy. Well, that's apropos and a timely segue into Highway Commercial One, uh, you know, because that um, uh, um, that's obviously been a focus of much of the work that we've been doing for many years here. And as we all know, the planning board is advancing a plan with uh, uh, a joint committee with FinCom and the select board to redevelop and um, we want to, you know, the core question is, do we see a substantially reduced demand in uh, commercial space in the suburbs, uh, in particular office or lab, or um, and a higher demand in other and other parts of the commercial sector generally, um, or is demand for um, uh, commercial office and lab space, for instance, still strong enough to continue with that exercise and with that model, trying to build in the regulatory framework, some flexibility that some of you have mentioned will be helpful and important in the overall mix of attracting a developer for that site. Um, if I could give an opinion, please. Um, it, it's things have, to me, have flipped sort of. Um, warehouse distribution along 128 has been basically demolished and, and replaced with the quote higher and better use, whether it's office or retail or whatever. And, and things at, at this point in time with the e-commerce uh, economy have, have flipped a little bit and, and that warehouse space is hard to find. Um, in a way, from a development standpoint, uh, one of the pluses is it, it costs a lot less money to build a warehouse than it does a lab. A lab is a big capital investment and a big bet. Um, and uh, you got to measure that against the, the demand. On the other hand, you're, you're, it's very, very difficult to find the amount of land that you need to build a significant warehouse space um, uh, you know, near, near a major intersection. Uh, you can't do it on small parcels of land. You need a big expanse of land in order to do that. And there just aren't any of those around. So it's an interesting dichotomy to me in this economy. It certainly, it certainly is. Uh, you know, Lee, um, you know, we talked before and you uh, provided some good information to the CA at the last meeting about the general makeup of um, uh, of the different types of models that we've been working on uh, for the overall density and floor area ratio and breakdown of um, uh, potential between, I think it was 15% uh, of the overall space, perhaps for um, uh, ancillary retail to the 85% uh, of office. Uh, slash lab space, something like that. Um, so we just want to make sure that there's, you know, the effect of the pandemic can be, you know, can either be immediate uh, or it can be long term. If it's long term, do we have to adjust the expectations for, you know, uh, we may for what we may have for that site, um, or you know, do we risk changing? Um, the whole composition and losing the market, uh, you know, for something that's a, in uh, a fairly short-term effect. 
uh, but right now we're continuing with the expectation that commercial remains, the demand for commercial uh, remains fairly strong between uh, office and, um, uh, and lab space, uh, you know, in the suburbs. And, you know, one of the things that we'll be modeling, Rick, is uh, you know, massing under um, current uh, current conditions, what a warehouse would potentially look like, you know, at that uh, at that site, um, you know, for that reason. And, and you rate, make a very good point that no one's going to make an investment for a small warehouse right at uh, a major intersection. That it would be a large, as large as possible type of. Uh, you know, activity, although we do hope for redevelopment, higher and best use in other, um, with other uses. So it seems like, I guess, from what I'm hearing from Mike and Bob and Rick, uh, Virginia, I'm curious for you know, to hear your opinion as well, and also from Adam, that in fact, office demand and or lab demand uh, in the suburbs does remain active. Is that a fair characterization? I'm going to refer to Adam because he's closer, but go ahead, Adam. Yeah. Adam, Adam, is the demand for lab, are they small independent users or are they uh, a, a, a bigger, bigger corporate presence? Bigger corporate, I would say, although there hasn't been that much activity on the lab front in, in like Newton and Needham because they really like to be in clusters. Um, so I think, you know, like Davis Company owns 115 Fourth Avenue in Needham and they have a pretty large lab space there. I think it's 25,000 or 28,000 square feet. And from what I've heard from them, they haven't had much activity. Um, you know, I think eventually it, it is going to happen because it started in Cambridge and then it spilled out to uh, Watertown and now to, to Waltham a bit as well. And I think it's going to work its way down, you know, down 95 um, to our area, you know, Newton and Needham really. Now, they, they typically need to go into these larger buildings um, that can support it and that it makes sense to convert to lab. Uh, like a lot of the listings we have are, let's say the buildings range from 15,000 square feet to 40,000 square feet, but the vacancies aren't that large. It's more like a lot of, you know, two to 8,000 square foot vacancies. And, you know, it's, it's, it's expensive to convert the space to lab. So if they're going to do it, they want to do it for these larger, you know, pieces basically. Um, but there are plenty of buildings that, that can accommodate like Boston properties building on Kendrick street or, you know, I know like Mike's uh, or Bullfinch's building at, at 117 Kendrick. You guys have a lab tenant in there, right? Um, I'm drawing a blank. We, on we that. have two lab tenants. One actually outsourced all their research and they just have office and it's called Veristem. And then they took their, we took their existing space and leased it to a company called uh, Kendall. Um, but, you know, we have lab in Cambridge as well. And, you know, lab typically uh, wants to see lab build out. So it's sort of hard to attract lab unless you've got a developer who's made a commitment to create that product because it's all about speed to market. You know, they can't wait for full building rehab and then do the tenant improvement work, which, you know, by definition for lab takes, uh, you know, up to six months. They need to see the infrastructures in place now. So, Boston Properties is doing it in, in, in uh, Waltham. They're taking their office buildings and, and um, a couple of them and, and basically repositioning them, but they're gonna be successful because they basically, you know, have dove into the, the lab and said, we're doing lab now and not sort of, oh, here, here are some pictures of what our lab building will look like. Uh, that doesn't work with lab tenants. Yeah, because they get funding and they need to go like now. They can't wait, um, you know, however long it takes to, to fund it. So yeah, like 200 West Street, Boston Properties building up in Waltham. They're converting that all to lab. I mean, that's a gigantic building and they've made the commitment. You can't just be, you know, half in. You got to go fully in to, to convert the building and get it ready and everything. So, I mean, it's, it's a risk, but I think if you're doing it in, in the right areas, it's, um, it, it, there'll be the rewards, so. Interesting. Well, uh, Amy and I will probably want to follow up with you both to better understand what's in the food chain for lab space. Uh, you know, that would be 
uh, helpful. We'll do that offline. Um, uh, Amy, I'm going to turn it over to you for an economic development manager update. Don't skip Virginia. Virginia, I, you're absolutely right, Rick. I apologize, Virginia. Oh, no, I just want to say I'm the um, other folks on the committee are closer to the local trends, and I agree with what folks are saying. Just one thing about lab is there's different tiers of lab build outs. So I guess when you're thinking and, you, you know, I guess when you're digging into it, I would look into that aspect of it. And like was mentioned, it's quite expensive to create a lab building. Thank you very much. Okay, economic development manager report. So I've been continuing to be in close contact with the small business community throughout Needham to check in, see how they're doing. And uh, that includes recently, um, there was a letter that was sent out to over 80 small businesses in town from town manager Kate Fitzpatrick, assistant town manager Katie King and myself with updates on you know, what the town is doing to help them. Um, and if you haven't actually seen it, there was an article in the Needham Times yesterday, which is up on wickedlocal.com, which also mentions uh, the things that the town is, is, is doing as far as extending the outdoor dining, you know, extending the tent on the common, which is actually gonna be taken down on the fourth, um, other types of things. So th those were all included in the letter and I'm happy to forward, um, forward that to you. Um, but the, actually the article in the Needham Times was under the guise of uh, letting people know about late Thursday nights, which I helped, uh, well, I actually organized with Needham retailers, Needham Center retailers. So we've got 11 retailers that are staying open late on Thursday evenings. We kicked it off uh, November 12th. And starting this week, we've got a total of 11 retailers and I've got seven restaurants who are also participating in cross-promotional um, activities. So worked closely with Cindy Gonzalez, the public information officer to get the word out um, and encourage the retailers and the restaurants to also send out e-blasts to their customers to post on social media and on their websites to help spread the word. Um, so the, the hope is to increase foot traffic and, and sales on Thursday evenings. Most of the restaurants have opted to um, focus on promotions that are going to increase sales of their gift cards. So in, in some instances, like Latina, for example, is giving an additional $25. If you, if you purchase a gift card for $100, they will throw in an extra $25 on the gift card. Um, so uh, that is in the midst of happening. Um, I have been attending a lot of workshops and also letting the small businesses know of them that I'm attending them, but also you know, they're busy, so they don't have necessarily time to take out of their days to attend. But for example, this Thursday, I'm attending a, a webinar specifically for restaurants. Um, and it's actually being put on by several towns up on the North Shore. Um, and i have on a million different mailing lists and got the heads up on that. So it's, um, you know, how to be proactive and not reactive workshop, the key to surviving COVID winter for restaurants. Um, it's going to discuss ways to look at your finances and make key decisions to help your business improve financial performance, especially customers' revenues are down. Learn about other resources available for food-based businesses as they pivot and make plans for the coming months. So, you know, whether there's going to be any million-dollar idea shared at, you know, either this webinar that we haven't already heard remains to be seen, but it's always helpful uh, to hear what other towns and cities are doing and, and sharing best practices. Um, which also leads me to um, continuing to attend the bi-weekly meetings that I have with, there's about 20 economic development directors in towns and cities in the greater Boston area. I have a bi-weekly Zoom meeting with them um, on Wednesdays. I have another one today. So it's discussing um, things like state funding and, and what other cities and towns are doing to support the small business community. Um, and as a follow-up, um, you recently heard uh, the state released through the Massachusetts Growth Capital Corporation about $52 million in funding for small businesses. And uh, I just read yesterday that there was over 10,000 applications for this funding, which is just, you know, unbelievable. Um, so, you know, a very small fraction of the businesses that need the help are, are going to get it. Um, 
I applied to be a neighborhood partner for Small Business Saturday, which was this past Saturday. So I did receive a box of promotional items from Amex and the Small Business Saturday organizer. Um, unfortunately, it was a little disappointing this year. I would have thought that in a year where small businesses have been you know, pushed to the brink and challenged more than ever, that they would have really upped the ante, but that unfortunately wasn't the case this year. Um, I've been doing Small Business Saturday for the last decade, and this year was probably about a third of what they normally send, but I was able to distribute the materials to the small businesses. Um, the chamber actually passed along some signage they had made um, for uh, small businesses. So I walked around uh, Needham Center and extended areas last week and, and just checked in with folks. And the feedback is, is that Small Business Saturday did go very well. It was a nice day out. There were people around and the small businesses seemed to have increased sales. So they were um, pretty thrilled about that. And you know, it overlapped with the 100 day campaign for um, you know, supporting Needham businesses through the chamber, um, but you know, there's never any harm in you know, as much messaging as possible to encourage people to support small businesses. Um, through my uh, participation in the downtown working group um, of which uh, Mo is involved um, as well, I recommended some spots throughout Needham Center for curbside pickup and I'm having signage made that is gonna be put in 12 locations throughout Needham Center on Great Plain Ave, on Chapel Street and Highland Ave, and also Dedham Ave uh, at the rear of Latina Restaurant. And there are gonna be sandwich board signs that will let people know that those spots are reserved 10 minute parking for not only you know, the retailers, uh, but also restaurants. So it basically says 10 minute reserve parking, curbside pickup, support Needham's local businesses. So those will um, be up by early next week. And then as far as business updates, um, we did get the news through um, Sandy Sincata and the town manager's office who is uh, in charge of working with local restaurants and establishments for their liquor license renewals. We did hear that Blue on Highland is renewing their liquor license, which was good news as well as, um, and they plan to open in the spring and the Sheridan Needham is also renewing their liquor license and is also looking to reopen in the spring. So those, were two positive uh, developments in, in recent weeks as well. Thank you. Can I ask a question about the Needham Sheridan? Yes. Is, so they're looking to reopen. I had received a call um, probably about six, eight weeks ago from uh, an investment company, an investment group in New York asking about it and it you know, being on the market for sale. Had anyone else heard that? I had not heard that. They had asked me about converting, you know, my thoughts on converting it to office space um, and, you know, how feasible that is. I said not very, um, but uh, yeah, that's, I, that was the only time I heard about it from, from anybody, so. Um, Just I haven't heard. I have, uh, I have a question. Uh, Virginia, before we get to you, Mo had his uh, hand. Oh, sure. Uh, up as well. Mo, you're muted. L let Virginia ask her question first, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if, if the tent can stay longer or if there's something for the winter that's sort of like a gathering spot, like a tent or like invite, because, you know, you go out to Colorado and people sit outside all year long. So is there some way we can make sort of a gathering spot in the middle of the common that's either leaving the tent or something else. Do you want to take that, Amy, or do you want me to do it? Um, well, it's my understanding that the um, the picnic tables, there will be several picnic tables that will remain up, but the tent okay. needs to be removed um, because it is not, um, it's not built to be able to withstand um, any kind of snow. Uh, so, you know, the, I think the plan is to re return it again uh, in the spring, but it will be removed on the 4th of December, just in a couple of I have days. a delivery. I'll be right back. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, I don't uh, know if there's a way to, I don't know, maybe part of the, um, when you're on your, uh, and I can try to look into this too, like well, how, do, how do people in inclement weather areas keep the outside spaces, you know, like, keep reading, like Finland does it and. Yeah, 
<laughs> so, the, so there's been, so I've attended a lot of webinars and there's some great ideas out there as far as providing some gathering space. Um, as the numbers continue to creep up, you know, there is that sort of fine line of you yeah. know, not wanting necessarily to encourage public gathering. Um, in Massachusetts specifically, there are a lot of towns and cities that have pretty restrictive, um, uh, let's say, uh, not zoning, but um, the restrictions as far as you know, uh, the use of open flame, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. I attended a specific webinar on on placemaking in the winter, and a lot of them were you know have you know open fires and put Adirondack chairs around and that sort of thing. So so the regulatory um, sort of hurdles that need to be jumped, but there actually is that's actually one of the topics that we're talking about at our meeting today at noon with the, the economic development group, sort of how you sort of navigate around any kind of regulatory restrictions and still have placemaking types of activities yeah. um, in, okay. in the winter. I don't, I don't know if Amy addressed this, but there is a procurement issue on the tent as well. So, but the snow loading was an issue. The main one. Um, there is a shortage of heaters. So that's another issue for us. But the question I had for Amy is, um, I noticed that um, Closet Exchange has reduced its footprint. That's correct. Do we have other vacancies in the downtown? The art store is gone. The art store is gone. Uh, Polywogs is closing up at the end of December. So that would be another vacant space. So I'm reaching out to the landlords to get better uh, clarification on you know, what size the spaces are and and just being in touch with them because I, I do get contacted from time to time from prospective businesses who may be looking for space and don't necessarily you know, know where to start or just giving a shout out and, and wanting to see if, you know, if we're aware of any vacancies. So just keeping in touch with the landlords and having the heads up on any uh, future vacancies. And, and the hope is to, you know, to work with them and help you know, try to get the best fitting kind of tenant that would be a complement to the existing business space uh, in, in Needham Center. I mean, you know, there's lots of, you know, inquiries from nail salons because their overhead is generally low and, you know, we don't want to be filling all of these vacancies in, in town with uh, multiple nail salons. So I'm into that. Um, and the other question is, do, you, oh, do we have any evidence that landlords are being more forgiving with respect to rent? or are they helping any of the tenants? You know, anecdotally, I am hearing that a lot of the tenants have been in touch with landlords who have been you know, accommodating in um, you know, allowing them extra time to pay rent or deferring their rent payments um, to a later date. So there's, there's definitely that going on. Okay. Uh, one one question. I, chime in. I just want to chime in on that. Just something that irked me um, that I learned of last week. A tenant in, in uh, one of the buildings that we work on apparently reached out to the landlord early on and and you know asked for a rent or not that early on, but a couple months ago asked for a, you know rent discount or whatever um, because business was was hurting. Uh, so he said, and then so the landlord granted it to him because he's you know a good guy literally like three months later, the tenant calls the landlord and says, actually, and now um, what do you have for other space in the building? We need to double in size. And it's like, so you just asked for a discount because everybody's asking for rent relief. And now you're saying your business is doing so well that you're doubling in size. It just, it just goes to show you what, you know, what kind of people there are out there. Rick, I'm going to come to you in a second. David had his hand up. But before, David, we get to you, while we are uh, uh, talking a little bit about vacancy, particularly in the downtown, Amy, um, uh, I think you did a little bit of research and you uh, found a town that had passed some kind of ordinance that had uh, effectively utilized vacant space that still showed vibrancy I think through a display, uh, like an art display or something. That's correct. So, so the, the the town of Arlington actually has adopted adopted a bylaw several years ago, in which landlords are required to register vacant spaces with the town, and pay an annual fee of four hundred dollars until the space is filled. 
they can get around paying that $400 fee if they agree to display public art in their storefronts. Now, my hope would be able to, you know, work with the landlords to um, have something like that happen without having to adopt um, any kind of, you know, new bylaw. It would just be, you know, you know, cultivating the relationships with the landlords to help them understand that making the storefronts more attractive is not only going to bring more, you know, positive attention to their vacant space and, and hopefully um, help to rent it, but it also has an impact on the surrounding businesses and the community um, overall. So you know, th that would be my intent is, is to try to make that happen without having to seek, you know, adopting a new bylaw. Hopefully we'll find amenable landlords uh, because it certainly is far more attractive to see that than to see, you know, uh, and I understand, we understand that businesses, landlords have to promote and advertise space for lease, but sometimes when they are covered up with newspaper print in the windows, uh, you know, if there's an alternative that, uh, you know, still uh, shows vibrancy um, would be a, a benefit. Uh, David, I'm going to uh, come to you now, and then to Rick. Okay, just a quick follow-up on, um, Rick had asked, I think last month, if anybody knew anything about what's going on in Blue on Highland, and, and it was mentioned a few minutes ago, and I, I don't have any inside information, but I do live around the corner, and I walk by it regularly, and noticed that they um, not only have kept the place pristine, but um, they actually decorated for the fall, as they often do, in terms of outdoor um, sort of plantings, and stuff so it seems like they are they are still very much invested in it, it looks as if they've just closed for the day you know it, 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 so i just thought i'd pass that on thank you so it's a very well healed uh ownership uh so i think i think they're in a position to weather the storm just one thing i wanted to say uh i guess in defense of landlords <laughs> Um, that uh, you, you have to re remember also that landlords are businesses as well. And many times, um, well, if, if they have debt on their property, uh, they can't just negotiate a benefit to the tenants without consulting with and getting approval from their bank. So many times, you know, uh, I think landlords take a hit because they're not, they're not, you know, willing to do this or do that. And uh, sometimes there's a process that landlords have to follow and uh, they have to get permission from, uh, from their banks. Otherwise they'll be in default of their loans and nobody wants that. So anyway, just thought I'd bring that up. Absolutely, thank you for raising that. Mike. Um, I have to jump at 10.30, but I wanted to bring up a point and I don't wanna you know, jump ahead of, of new business or whatever. But, you know, <clears throat> as anyone in the area has seen constructions underway with road improvements that started in Needham uh, last month, it's going to start in Newton, um, I think in a week or so. Deborah had this um, <clears throat> distribution system that she used uh, with the DOT uh, update of what's going on where. Um, if you've driven around, you see they've taken over the Acapulco's uh, site. They've taken over the three square site for a, for a lay down area. But I'm just wondering, and you know, for better or worse, we don't have sort of the same sort of traffic issues that we did when the um, Kendrick Street interchange was being done. But I'm um, just wondering if we have that system in place where at least people can understand what's going on at, during typically it would be what's coming up in the week ahead kind of thing. And she would send them out on Fridays if people recall that. And I think it was a requirement of the last contractor. I don't know what the requirements are uh, under this new contract, but I think it would be helpful if we maybe look at getting that, um, you know, sent out again. So at least for the people who are still coming into the park and understand what, you know, the potential disruptions may be uh, with the project. Thank you for raising that. Uh, Amy, that's uh, something that we can chat about and it would be great if we can you know, bring that back. If it's a system that already existed, we should be able to find it. Lee, you, I don't know if you on the spot here, but you might be able to help us access what Deborah had done before. So 
all those files have actually been shared with Amy. So she has access to all that information. Great. So uh, we can coordinate some kind of an action plan for that uh, during the long phase of construction um, uh, and improvements that we can communicate regularly. Um, uh, thanks for raising that, Mike. Okay, hey Adam, I got to join. I got to join Michael. I got to sign off here. So uh, okay. thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Happy New Year, and everyone be safe for that. Rick, go ahead. You're on mute, Rick. <laughs> All I said was, have a great holiday. <laughs> uh, Lee, uh, you're now up on the agenda for um, uh, an update on permits and uh, other activity and planning. Okay, so I think last time um, I updated you on the two large projects that the planning board is processing. Um, so I'll give you an update on their status. The first really is the 140 Kendrick Street, which is where Parametrics was previously located and IDG is going into that facility and converting it basically from a single tenant occupancy um, to a multi-tenant occupancy. Um, which is requiring improvements in the building itself um, and improvements on the exterior in terms of improved uh, access to Cutler Lake. The planning board um, signed off on that permit last night and issued it. So um, they'll be free to go forward with the implementation of the renovations and improvements at that property now. Um, um, the planning board held a public hearing, the first the opening of the public hearing on Children's Hospital. Um, two weeks ago, and um, there were some issues that surfaced regarding um, transportation issues, traffic improvements that might be required, and questions about the traffic study that had been prepared. Um, so the hearing was continued um, to the planning board's next meeting on December 15th, um, and I anticipate we'll be able to resolve those issues with children's, um, and it's planned to have a, a decision issued on the property um, at the planning board's first meeting, uh, the 1st of January on the 4th. Um, in terms of additional permits that have been filed subsequent to our last meeting, we received an application, not specifically for commercial development, but for a residential apartment building in the Hillside Avenue business district at 400 Honeywell, which anticipates the construction of eight residential units um, at that at that location. Um, I have had some inquiries. I don't want to be specific about the properties involved. Um, there, are, there is a property owner who is looking at redevelopment opportunities in Needham Center to take advantage of the zoning that we pass um, through the overlay districts um, to, uh, for mixed use redevelopment. So I do have somebody that's exploring at least um, on a preliminary basis um, redevelopment um, of a block in Needham, which would convert it from a single story building to a three story building with apartments above the commercial space. But again, that's in a very preliminary stage and I don't want to really disclose anything beyond what I've just told you about that project. And then lastly, I guess the most, uh, the major planning project that we're working on, as Adam mentioned earlier in the meeting, is Highway Commercial One. And I think some of you attended the uh, presentation that GPI did on the traffic studies that have been done to show the impacts of the build out um, at a 1.35 FAR and how they might be accommodated in terms of infrastructure improvements. That study is now done, it's available online. I can send the linkages out to this committee. Um, additionally, if you're interested, um, the presentation that GPI did to both the Finance Committee, Select Board and Planning Board um, was recorded under that Zoom meeting. And so you can hear the full presentation to better understand uh, the impacts of what development at that scale would look like um, and what the proposed um, infrastructure improvements to accommodate it um, uh, would include. Um, we are presently moving forward now with the development of the urban design plan for that property. Um, um, we are, I'm working out the final scope of work with the urban design team that's going to be preparing those plans and drawings for the planning board. And we um, plan or we anticipate being able to begin reviewing that work in January um, so that we can finalize the urban design component of this and move forward with zoning changes in the spring um, informed by uh, the build out, informed by the traffic study, um, the urban design component that's going to be developed in January and ultimately a complementary fiscal impact study. Thank you. 
very much. Uh, anything else from, from planning, Lee? No, I think that that's pretty much all, all I need to report. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Can I have this question? Yes. I, I just, um, Lee, I don't, and this is just sort of uh, something I was been wondering about. Is, is there like a, have we considered, um, I know that Wellesley has that big development that's happening up by the Boston Sports Club. And I think traffic is pretty bad already on Central Ave, um, certainly around school time and rush hour. Um, you know, and then we're going to have this big development in Newton um, on Highland Avenue. Um, is, is, is there a way that the town or is, or is this, like, how do we look at traffic impacts and sort of, um, you know, and Mo and I had talked a long time about, about how Waze has everybody cutting through Needham. Like, it just seems like I'm just concerned about all these projects that are abutting the town that are going to impact Needham as people cut through. Has um, that ever been considered or? Well, I think they're, they're, they, they've been considered in terms of um, a background growth number um, being, um, being projected uh, you know, on an annual basis moving 10 years out, um, assuming you know, similar distribution patterns to what you currently see now in terms of traffic loads on different streets and percentage distributions across streets. But as part of the traffic study, um, uh, background growth is always factored in. Um, and it was done at a conservative level here. Um, in light of the numbers that we actually um, saw as a result of um, changes as a function of the Adelaine project and reductions actually in, tra in traffic um, as a result of COVID. Got it, thank you. Does anybody else have any other business? Then um, uh, before we adjourn, I'd uh, just like to say to everybody that uh, this has been you know, uh, uh, an important exercise over the last uh, many months, uh, trying to find ways to help business, you know, survive through a, an extraordinarily rough patch. Um, again, I'd just like to mention, as I did at the top, if anyone has other ideas or goals in mind for uh, other initiatives that we should consider and pursue beyond what we've already identified, please do email either myself or Amy or both of us. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, Anne-Marie, myself, and, uh, and Amy will be looking at uh, establishing some additional goals for next year. Um, and I just want to wish everybody a very safe holiday season. The next time we get together will be in a new year. Much to be optimistic about. Um, and uh, thank you all very much for your valuable and significant contributions over the last uh, many months uh, since we've been dealing with this and uh, really in the beginning of uh, March. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can Thanks I? Thanks for your leadership, Adam. And I'm going to move to adjourn if you want that motion. So uh, I, I appreciate that. that. Uh, thank you very much. We have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Yes, I move second. Thank you very I much. Second. Any seconds. Um, uh, any discussion? Seeing none, hearing none, uh, I'll take a vote. Um, I'll take a vote uh, by who I see here. Uh, uh, Bill. Uh, yes. David. David, we can't hear you. Sorry, right, yes. Uh, Virginia. Yes. Rick. Yes, and I want to take uh, this moment to wish everyone a safe, healthy, and happy holiday season and new year. It's Thank been a pleasure you. sitting on this on this committee and, and Adam, I, I uh, uh, echo uh, Mo's comments that you've done a terrific job and, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Mo. Uh, yes. Bob. Yes. Adam. Yes. Glenn. Yes. Anne Marie. Yes. Uh, and the chair is I. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Aye. Bye. Take care. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New Year. Happy Hanukkah. Yeah. Uh, did the Coca Cola factory, I remember we were talking about it a while ago. Um, mm. What did they end up doing with that? Did they end up transferring that to? 
um, do the, what is it, vending machine? Um, it's distribution now. So it is distribution, okay. Because it's distribution. Production. And not production? They're not, not production. Correct. Not, no production, so it's just distribution. So they're producing it elsewhere and then bottling it there? Or like No, distributing, just distribution. Okay. That's my understanding. I could be corrected, but my understanding is it's just distribution. They right. were our biggest water right. customer. Yeah, that's why I was asking. I was curious. That they that subsidized our town water, believe me. So, uh, yeah, big loss that way. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.